Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for my top 10 comic books of the week. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. This is the top 10 comic books of the week for February 19th, 2020. These are my personal top 10 favorite comic books. There were a lot of fantastic books out this week, but these are the 10 that I want to spotlight, that I want to highlight as maybe books you should be reading. And I want you to spotlight the books that you think everybody else should be reading in the comments down below. But without much further ado, let's get into it. At number 10, we've got The Low Low Woods, number three from DC Black Label and Hill House Comics, written by Carmen Maria Machado with artwork by Danny and coloring by Tamara Von Villain. Yo, The Low Low Woods, number three, was a really good issue, but kind of like Jim Mint from Jim Mint Collectibles, I don't really quite know what exactly is going on. I find myself to be a little bit confused at times, but what I know for certain is that this book is atmospheric and it's highly effective. It is downright unsettling and unnerving. And if you watch the weekly comic book review, that's, I kept repeating that because that's really all I can say about this book. It's got a what seems to be a simple premise. It's about these two young women that live in this town. I believe it's in in, in Pennsylvania or something, I think. I'm not sure. But it's one of those smallish type towns that you, sometimes it seems like you just can't escape. A small town trap, right? So it takes the horror element that's present in most Hill House comics and it thematically relates it to the idea of trying to escape this town or feeling like you couldn't escape this town. All these people die in these tragic events. It's a mining town. It's got all these legends behind it, all this mythology, and then actual crazy stuff starts happening, right? And nothing crazier than in issue number three. This book is very, very effective. The characterization is spot on. You understand these characters, you relate to these characters. The coloring and the artwork is amazing. Danny, first of all, a fantastic artist. They worked on um, Coffin Bound from last year with Dan Waters from Image Comics. Um, and in, this is a different type of style. It's a little gritty. It's very textured. Um, it's, it's almost ethereal in a way. You add in Bon Villain's coloring. Her coloring is amazing. She's really standing above and beyond some of the rest right now as one of the best colorists in the business, especially if you look at work like Once in Future. But this book, really cool. Very subtle, very low-key. A little confusing, very challenging, but I absolutely love comic books that are challenging. This is one of them for me. By far, just Hill House Comics has been dominating as far as horror goes. In fact, I've said this many times before, we're in a new golden age, a renaissance of horror comic books right now, and Hill House is kind of part of all of that with other books like Gideon Falls and Red Mother and things like that. Maybe we'll talk about one of those books here in this video. But The Low Low Woods, number three, if you like a challenging horror comic book that's character driven, but is really very effective in its unnerving and unsettling nature, check out Low Low Woods. At number nine, we have Sarah and the Royal Stars, number six, from Vault Comics, written by John Sway, with artwork by Audrey Mock, coloring by Raul Angulo, and Jim Campbell on the lettering. So Sarah and the Royal Stars kicks off the second arc this week with issue number six, and it really keeps that momentum and that pace and that vibe and that flow alive from the first arc. Sarah and the Royal Stars has been a great high fantasy book with a lot of Asian and Persian influence to it, and the artwork by Mock is absolutely amazing. I said this when it first debuted last summer, but the artwork is a perfect um, amalgamation of the, 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 the Eastern, like, anime like manga type art and an American comic book art like what you're used to here. It really combines those two elements and styles into one really fantastic artistic book. I love it so much. Those colorings are the coloring is absolutely amazing. The lettering is top notch of course because it's Jim Campbell but John Sway has been able to do what most people can't do and create this whole high fantasy world and realm and story that is completely captivating and compelling to me. I'm not usually the biggest fantasy fan, but I love this one so much. Maybe because it ties in a little bit to astrology and mythology, especially Persian mythology, but I absolutely love it. I love the nods to the past. 
I love the innovative drive towards the future that this book has, as most Vault comic books have as far as technique goes. This book is amazing. I'm so glad it's continuing beyond issue number five, and I hope it continues for more than just two arcs. This book is great. I love it. I love the characters. I love the essence of it. This book is a little tragic. It's got great artwork. I highly recommend it. At number eight, we have Bang Number One from Dark Horse Comics, written by Matt Kent with artwork by Wilfredo Torres and Nayong Kim on the coloring. So Bang Number One is a very interesting take on the James Bond concept. You know, we got this fan theory that's been going around for a while now. What if James Bond is just a code name? What if each actor who has played James Bond, from Sean Connery all the way through Daniel Craig, what if that's actually a different, unique individual that's continuing the legacy of the code name James Bond? Well, it's a cool idea. It makes a lot of sense, and it kind of really fills in some of those gaps if you can see them throughout the movies, right? This is a book that takes that idea and actually does it. So basically, it's about a secret agent, a James Bond type character, but every time one of them dies, a new one comes along. And in Matt Kent fashion, it's not just a code name, but there's brainwashing and mind control involved. These people legitimately think that they're this person with this past. It was a great issue, had great action, had a really nice sense of pace and flow and mystery to it. I absolutely love this, and it really gives us yet again another strong case of why Idris Elba could totally be James Bond and pull it off. This book is amazing. If you're a Matt Kent fan, you're going to love this book. If you're a James Bond fan, I think you're going to love this book. In fact, I would say, and no shade on anybody who's ever written a James Bond comic book before, because that also includes Danny Lore, Vita Ayala, and Warren Ellis, Andy Diggle and Company. Um, but this book may be my favorite James Bond comic book that I've ever read. Bang Number One was great. It's going to be a sleeper hit. Try to find it in your shops already. And if you're a speculator, I believe that there's some speculation right now that this is going to come morph into a TV show or a movie or something like that, and it's ripe for it. It's a fresh take on a classic idea like James Bond, and I absolutely loved it. Made the top 10. At number seven, we've got Daredevil, number 18 from Marvel Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky with artwork by Jorge Fornes and coloring by Nolan Woodard. Daredevil is hands down, bar none, one of Marvel's best superhero comic books out on shelves right now. Chip Zdarsky understands the legacy of the character. He understands how to take that legacy and, and, and throw it into the future and do something that's very reminiscent of the classic Daredevil stories we love from people like Gene Colan, Frank Miller, Denny O'Neill, Kevin Smith, David Mack, Joe Quesada, Brian Michael Bendis, um, and even going into Ed Brubaker and, and Mark Wade. right? The legacy of Daredevil is solid and secure with Chip Zdarsky. He's doing such an amazing job with this book. Um, and I love Jorge Fornes' artwork. This dude was born to draw Daredevil. Look at David Kelly's work on Daredevil Born Again, and even Batman Year One. And then look at Jorge Fornes' artwork on Daredevil, and tell me there's not an uncanny resemblance. Not a swipe, not, 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 not mimicking his style. It's a different style, it's a different approach, but it's very simple. Very, I mean, it's very similar with the, that, that simple line work, but it's very elegant and it really flows through the story. It's got excellent composition. Chip Zdarsky just keeps amping this book up, ramping up the action. We are about to hit such a big giant thing right now in the pages of Daredevil. I love this book so much. And Daredevil has been one of the most consistent Marvel comic books over the last several decades with always outstanding great runs that always build off what came before, but kind of blaze their own trail ahead into the future. I love this book so much. Every time it comes out, I'm so excited. This book could come out every week. In fact, two issues a week, and I would be cool with that. I wouldn't complain. I'd be totally down for that. Chip Zdarsky understands the legacy of Marvel Comics, and he's able to take that and make it fresh for today's audience, and that's what he's doing with Daredevil. Then you add in that artwork, especially that coloring by Nolan Woodard, and I do want to say that the lettering is Clayton Cowles, and it is. And of course, that's one of the best letterers in the business, so it's an all-star creative team. Um, and it's just fantastic. In fact, if you want to hear more of my thoughts on Daredevil, it's his legacy, and some of my favorite runs, check me out this upcoming Friday night 
on Everything Comics. That's right, Bullseye Bob has invited me to join him for a discussion about some of our favorite Daredevil stories. A little bit of Doctor Doom's gonna throw in there, and you know we're gonna throw out some Dallas Cowboys love. How about him? Anyway, so join us Friday night on Everything Comics, and if you haven't checked out Everything Comics, it's definitely an invaluable resource for comic book fans. He's a great dude, and I'm very, very excited. Also, he's friends with Bueller, but I don't hold that against him. At number six, we have Skull Digger and Skeleton Boy from Dark Horse Comics, written by Jeff Lemire with artwork by Tone C. Sonjic and lettering by Steve Wands. Jeff Lemire can do no wrong. In fact, he's got three comic books alone on this week's top ten, and this is just the first one I'm going to be talking about. This is set in the world of Black Hammer. So Black Hammer is Jeff Lemire's own superhero universe that he's created, and because of what he's done, even though he's done with the initial phase of the story, the whole mystery of what's going on with the Black Hammer stuff, and if you've never read Black Hammer, you totally should. In fact, I'll throw links down below if you want to check him out at a great price and help support PCP all at the same time, and everybody wins. The Black Hammer world is a Amazing. What's really cool about it is that Jeff Lemire can make commentary on the different ages of comic books through this because he sets each um, story in a certain specific age according to the timeline of the Black Hammer universe. This story is set in the 90s, so it's obviously about the extreme nature of the 90s, all the anti-heroes, the ultra-violent comic books that we had um, that basically did glorify violence, right? The basic plot of this one is what if the Punisher found Batman right after Batman's parents were murdered, and it's little Bruce there. What if Punisher took Bruce Wayne and trained him to be his sidekick? His Robin, basically. That's the whole point of this. This kid's parents are murdered. He's found by this dude, Skull Digger. He wants to join up with him, train, learn how to take on revenge. So it has all those classic moments that you know and love from a Punisher story or definitely from Batman. It's got influences from both. And it really does speak a lot about the nature of comic books in the 90s, that post-Watchmen anti-hero extreme violence kind of buzz that was going on. It really speaks to that. The artwork is so freaking fresh. It's beautiful and it's amazing. And Steve Wands pretty much letters every Jeff Lemire comic book and I can't imagine anybody else doing it. He really has a very elegant way of, of putting those words there and making them float there as a part of the art in exceptional ways. I love this book so much. Anything from Black Hammer, I'm sold on. Anything from Jeff Lemire, I'm sold on. Anything from this creative team, I will be sold on. The artwork is fresh, it's clean, it's modern, and it's innovative, yet its story feels very classic, nuanced, and a great deal of respect to those extreme comics from the 90s. At number five, we have Family Tree, number four, from Jeff Lemire, Dark Horse Comics, Phil Hester, Eric Gapster, Ryan Cody, and Steve Wands. Here we go, yet another Jeff Lemire comic book. This dude is such a prolific writer. He's like the Stephen King of comic books. He's writing like eight comic books at the same time or something like that. It's ridiculous. I don't know how he does it, but he does it, and I'm so glad that he does. It seems like Jeff cannot run out of ideas. Family Tree comes across as a very simple idea. There's this family, it's set in the 90s, but there's this family, and this young girl in the family starts slowly turning into a tree. Well, most people could take that, and that's a fun, cool concept, and they'll do something with it, maybe a little generic, cliche at times. That's not Jeff Lemire's style. This is a book that is steeped with a family tragedy, but it's also very adventurous, it's action-packed, it's very dynamic, and it flows so well, aided by the illustrious Phil Hester. Phil Hester's got a great angular style that really fits this story, really fits this world and these characters. In this issue, Grandpa just becomes an absolute badass. It's fantastic stuff. I love this book. Jeff Lemire can do no wrong right now. He's got such amazing ideas, and his execution on those ideas is the most amazing thing. I actually don't think it's that difficult to come up with a bunch of ideas, but to execute those ideas into full-fledged comic books that just absolutely astound and amaze people, pfft, that's something Jeff Lemire's doing, and it seems like he's only getting better. I thought he would have hit his peak a couple years ago, but it hasn't happened yet, especially when he's joined by people like Hester and Gapster and Cody and Wands. An amazing book. I absolutely love it. If you haven't been checking out Family Tree, you really should. This is a book that's just aching for some studio somewhere to come and pick up the rights for a movie or anything like that. You know, and it happened with Descender, and we still haven't gotten anything out of it, so maybe nothing will ever come out of this, but eh. Everything Jeff Lemire does is turning to gold right now. Family Tree, no exception. At number four, we've got Wolverine number one from Marvel Comics, written by Benjamin Percy with artwork by Adam Kubert and Victor Bogdanovic. 
So Dawn of X is rolling right on through, and now we're hitting wave two of a whole slew of new titles. And I know that we already got some really outstanding X titles right now, and it seems like maybe this is too much, too soon, too many X books, or anything like that. I'll tell you this, though. As long as the quality is, is continuing the way it is, I am sold. Benjamin Percy has been writing X-Force, and he's been doing such an excellent job that I, I, I actually say that X-Force is as much, if not more, of required X reading than Jonathan Hickman's X-Men right now. The book is amazing. Wolverine is no exception. Benjamin Percy understands not only the character of Logan, but he understands what makes a great Wolverine story. This book is filled with that stoic, um, that stoic, uh, nature of Wolverine. It gets into his character. Um, it gets into why he cares about people and how he responds to that care. Um, even though he is very much a character that is straight up an example of the philosophy of Stoicism, and which I'm a big fan of, to be honest. And Adam Kubert's artwork. So it's it's seven ninety nine, but it's sixty four pages of illustrated story. That's not including the black and white info dump pages because they're there. That keeps that Dawn of X Hickman aesthetic going, but not including those pages or any of the other filler type bits. This is still 60 full pages of glorious artwork by Adam Kubert and Victor Bondanovic. This is two separate full stories. The first one is the main story. And Adam Kubert, how is this cat getting better? He is my favorite Wolverine artist, like favorite artist on the solo Wolverine title. He, he had a run in the 90s. It was amazing. It was really good stuff. But somehow this is even better. Of course, he's evolved his style. He's a veteran in the industry and he knows this character and understands the characters around it. He knows the nature of the of the beast, I should say. Um, Bogdanovic does a great job. He started off to me as almost a poor man's Greg Capullo, but really has defined his own style and his recent work over at DC just kept getting better and better and better and it flows right into this. He does the second story. Both stories are full 30 pages. The second story involves vampires and Omega Red and it's awesome. In fact, if you remember that variant cover they did, I think it was on House of X number six, maybe Powers, but I think it was House and it was like a, a, a view of things to come or something like that and it was Omega Red coming through one of the Krakoan portals. That moment happens in this issue. Wolverine's solo title usually is skippable for an X-Men fan, but not anymore. This book is amazing. Benjamin Percy continues that dynamic work that he's doing on X-Force into this, and it's amazing. You get appearance from other X characters, and I'm going to tell you what, I know there are a lot of X books coming, and it's going to get annoying at times, especially when they start their crossover this summer, but as long as the quality is this high, I'm definitely down. If not to, to read every single issue, definitely to trade weight, but I'm reading every single issue. It's the best there is at what he does, and he's back. At number three, we have The Red Mother, number three, from Boom Studios, written by Jeremy Hahn, with artwork by Danny LeCarte, and lettering by Ed Dukeshire. Oh my goodness, The Red Mother has just been blowing me away. Issue to issue to issue, it's amazing. It's got a great sense of pace. It's got great character work. It's dynamic, but it's also very mysterious. It's also very subtle. So it's direct and it's subtle, if that makes any kind of sense. This is a great horror comic book. It's about a woman who is attacked. She's involved in an attack. She loses her boyfriend. We don't know what's happened to him. She loses an eye. She gets a prosthetic. But ever since she loses her eyes... She kind of sees these visions, these crazy visions, and there's all this kind of stuff threaded throughout about the Red Mother. This is a very slow burn story. It's revealing just a little bit every issue, but the pace of each issue, the character work that's done, the artwork, everything about it flows so well. The artwork's got a nice simple style, but it's got a great use of perspective. I absolutely love it. And it really has these great dynamic moments of true, utter horror. Meanwhile, the rest of the book is built up on this very subtle nature of slowly revealing what's going on, slowly asking and, and answering those questions. The Red Mother is amazing. If you loved issue number one and issue number two, this is no exception. It keeps that exact same vibe, that exact same feel. I'm loving this book so much. I cannot wait to see how this is going to unfold. This story has absolutely engulfed my imagination, and I love it so much. The Red Mother from Boom Studios. Boom Studios has been cranking out amazing work right now, and to me, The Red Mother is one of the top of the piles. At number two, we've got Joker, Killer Smile from DC Black Label. Number three, written by Jeff Lemire with artwork by Andrea Sorrentino, coloring by Jordi Belair, and lettering by Steve Wands. 
Yet another Jeff Lemire book on the top 10 this week. Once again, proving exactly how prolific and amazing he is as a creator, especially when he's working with Andrea Sorrentino. That's the exact same creative team from Gideon Falls, this time joined by Jordi Belair on the coloring. Now, it seems like Jordi, especially since she's kind of taken off as a writer right now in books like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, has slowed up her, her coloring work. And Jordi Belair, for a while there, was my favorite colorist in the industry. This book proves why. The way that she's able to add atmosphere and richness to uh, Sorrentino's line work is absolutely flawless and amazing. Speaking of Sorrentino's line work, it's brilliant. It's beautiful. Excellent composition. Beautiful uh, lettering by Steve Wands. And the story by Jeff Lemire is downright atmospheric, creepy, and just messed up as hell. I'll tell you that. It's a very satisfying conclusion. This is the end of Joker Killer Smile. I'm loving these DC Black Label books. I know some people don't necessarily like the, the, the extra-sized magazine type format of it, but I love the way that the artists and the creators are working with that format and doing something a little bit different as far as layouts and composition goes, and even just the flow of the sequential storytelling. I absolutely love this book. It's been a great character study, not only on the Joker, but of the sad doctor. Can't remember his name right now, but this book was great, and it ends in a very dark way, not as dark as maybe I thought it was going to end, but it's absolutely appropriate and stunning. I love this book. It's beautiful. It's luxurious. It's glorious. And I know at times we're all like, we like DC Black Label, but can we get less bat-centric books? Pfft. As long as they're like this, I don't give an F. I love it. I thought it was amazing. It's my number two pick of the week. But it's not number one. At number one, Wonder Woman Dead Earth Book Two, written and artwork by Daniel Warren Johnson, coloring by Mike Spicer, lettering by Russ Wooten. Oh my goodness, this book was amazing. Wonder Woman Dead Earth number one, I thought was a really solid start to a story. The basic story is that Wonder Woman wakes up in a pod in the Batcave, and she wakes up, Batman's dead, most of the world is dead. It's this post-apocalyptic world now. Her powers have been affected. She's, she's less powerful than she was. Um, and there's these giant monsters that are ruling everything, these, these, these small pockets of, of human survivors, right? And so she picks, she, she comes across some of these survivors, she, she takes them on as her own, and she starts leading them to the Promised Land, which is going to be Themyscira. And two issues in, <laughs> in issue number two, they reach Themyscira, and it's not quite the paradise that she promised. In fact, it's quite a nightmare. I'm not trying to spoil much, but this book is amazing. Daniel Warren Johnson made his name on books like Extremity and Murder Falcon. Murder Falcon, by the way, probably should have made my top 10 last year, but it didn't, but it definitely made my top 11, I'll tell you that much. But I absolutely love Daniel Warren Johnson's artwork, his sense of flow and composition. I was talking during the Joker Killer Smile bit about how this, 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 this magazine format, this DC Black Label format, allows artists a little bit more room to play with things like composition and layout. Daniel Warren Johnson is using that to maximum effect in issue number two of Wonder Woman Dead Earth. This book's got some shocking surprises. It's got dynamic um, artwork. It's got really intense, brutal um, um, action scenes that are reminiscent of something like 300, but just with mutated beasts. It's got really gut-wrenching and tragic um, turns of events and explanations and revelations in the story. He's doing such an amazing job with this book, especially aided by Spicer's coloring. I really, really like it. Now, I know that some people have complained a little bit about the artwork on the book, and if you look at just a still image, you're like, that's not how I typically see or envision Wonder Woman being drawn. But really, just let the artwork flow in you and absorb it as you're reading this book. And you'll realize it's such a masterful work of art. It's amazing. The artwork is kinetic. And it slows down when it needs to. And those emotional moments have the impact that they deserve, that they need to make this book succeed. I absolutely love this book. It was my pick of the week. I could have picked pretty much anything on my top 10 is my pick of the week and it would have worked and people would have been like hell yeah that book was great but it had to go to Wonder Woman Dead Earth because it was even a vast improvement over issue number one and I loved issue number one it was super solid but this is even better and when a book gets better from issue number one to number two that's something we need to pay attention to and Daniel Warren Johnson is about to be a legend in this industry and we are here at the beginning of a whole long career hopefully in the industry I love this book so much 
What'd you think about it? Let me know in the comments down below, but it's definitely worth your time. Post-apocalyptic Wonder Woman craziness, but it's got a lot of nuance. It's got a lot of character work. It's very rich. It's tragic. It's adventurous. It's fun. And it's sad as hell at times. I love this book so much. Anyway, that's my top 10 comic books of the week. What are your top 10? What's your top five? What's your top three? I shared what I wanted. I shared what I thought should be some books that should be on people's radar. What do you think? What are books that should be on people's radar? Let's keep that conversation going down in the comments below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Be sure to join us on Friday night for Everything Comics. That's right. If you haven't subscribed to Everything Comics, Bob is a great dude. He's based in Portland. He's a friend with Bueller and Sam's Tangled Web and, and uh, uh, Damien from uh, Sleepy Time Reader, I think, Sleepy Reader 666. Um, a fantastic crew of YouTube comic book guys. I absolutely adore them. I cannot wait to meet them in person. But I'm very excited to have a chat with Bob on Friday night on his channel. So get over there, subscribe, get ready, click the notification bell so you get the notification. Friday night, I believe it's going to be 9 p.m. Central Time is what we're aiming for. Um, we're going to be talking about Daredevil. We're going to be talking about Dr. Doom. We'll be talking about the Cowboys. We'll be talking about lots of fun stuff and I'm really, really excited. So be sure to join us Friday night for that. Besides that, thank you for watching the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe and join us over at patreon.com slash PCP where you can unlock exclusive content and early access to shows like Comics Revisited and even the weekly comic book review as far as a, a downloadable audio file that's available hours before the video comes up. I think that's kind of worth it for a dollar a month. Anyway, join us over at Patreon if you want to support the channel. Otherwise, just thank you so much watching the videos, being here this far into the video, even though I'm just rambling on about our own shit. That's really, really cool, and I love you for it. Thank you so much. Here's my Michael Bluth begging for money. Anyway, I'm just kidding. What? Anyway, thank you so much for checking out the video. I've been rocking Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on living and reading and loving and learning and top tenning.